So the theme, of course, is Dog Days of Summer. So we are going to look at four different works of art in the museum collection that all feature dogs in some way. Uh, so this will be our first work. But before we jump in, I've got to know how many of you are dog people? Hi. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Do we have any cat people? Because I want to make this a safe space for them as well. OK, we've got some cat people putting your hands up. I do have a, an image for you at the end if you're a cat person. Dog um, and people. Dog, dog and, and cat. cat. Just animal lovers. All right, well, you're in the right place. Um, and bonus points to anyone whose dog or cat you know, jumps into the Zoom screen at any point during the conversation. <laughs> we, like, we like dogs who like the museum. So um, what, what, uh, when we started doing this dog themed tour, we realized we walked through the galleries and we realized there are so many representations of dogs in our collection. Um, and so artists use dogs in many different ways um, as, as symbols, um, to support a narrative, uh, maybe just to give a slice of life. So we'll look at a couple of very different examples today. Um, but this is the painting that I wanted to start with. Um, it's, a, it's a very timely painting in a lot of ways. So I'm going to throw it to you. Uh, what do you make of this painting as you're looking at the figures? How do you describe the expressions on their faces? What is the mood of this painting for you? And I should say too, if you're new to this format, feel free to just unmute yourself and jump right in. We don't have any formalities here. Serene. Serene. Okay, so Lynn is saying it's serene. And what do you see that's making you say serene? I'm looking at uh, the uh, woman's face, mm -hmm. kind of Madonna-like. Mm -hmm. And and the um, the person to her right with the arrows in him <laughs> looks looks sad, but not in anguish which is a little surprising. Yeah, so great observation. So you're starting here with this um, central Madonna-like figure and you're saying serene, you're looking at the expression on her face. She's looking right out at us. And then you're looking at this figure here, this young man who's being pierced through with arrows and you can even see the blood dripping down. Um, and nevertheless, he has a rather calm demeanor, um, maybe surprisingly, mm -hmm. yeah. So there's this kind of sense of, of calmness and ser serenity. Um, what else? How else might you describe this, uh, the mood of this painting? Yeah, I was going to say somber rather than serene. Okay, somber. And what did you see that made you say somber? Well, somehow with serene, I think of people, you know, um, happiness or joy or underneath the surface where this to me is doesn't doesn't have that feel underneath it's more pensive somber um sure yeah so so for you serenity sort of implies there's latent happiness um yes beneath the surface and yes. for you there's more of a the sobriety here there's not maybe that yes. sense of peace or joy sure Anyone else? I like Judy's answer better than mine. Okay, so Lynn is, Lynn is going now with uh, somber instead of serene. I think serene is still a very valid interpretation. I, I'll go with that. Any I other? would add, I would say resigned, but what hits me even more than that is that the dog has the same expression. Ah, I, I like that, Mary. You're calling out the dog. You're keeping us on. I'm calling out the dog, yes. There's a little I'm... dog here, so if you haven't noticed him, yes, he's here, and he's got the same expression as the people. He does, which I guess must be on purpose. I mean, yeah. it's probably the style. I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> so yes, it's amazing. Is, yeah, go well, amazing ahead, right? that I would not look this way if I had arrows sticking in me. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and and it's a look really... of acceptance. A acceptance. Acceptance. Okay. Acceptance so, of the situation. So they've sort of resigned themselves. To yeah. Yes. Yeah, resignation. Acceptance. acceptance. Okay. And, and while it looks like there's some kind of holiness to it, what's really out of character is that he's, the man has a seashell on his cloak mm. and, and there's like a dragonfly at the bottom. Yes. I like yeah. that. Yes. I and, noticed and, that. Yeah. And, it, and his, his boot, one boot is half off. I mean, I don't know what that's all about. 
Yeah, so he's exposing his bare thigh here, a little risque, although I guess the other figure is even more scantily clad. Um, so you're noticing, so Lynn, I'm, you're, you're the details person for us today. You've noticed right away that there's this scallop shell. There's also a dragonfly um, at the base of this sort of rock formation here. Um, and you're wondering what is going on? How do all of these pieces fit together? Well, yeah, because me... it doesn't look like Florida. You know, no, it does not look like Florida. <laughs> Well, well, more than that, isn't isn't it? Is it Saint Sebastian? Saint James. It's oh, Saint James. Sebastian. Saint Sebastian had arrows too. Yeah, so oh, the, no, this Saint, representation is is Sebastian here. Yeah, Saint okay, James is the uh, scallop shell. Right, but Saint Sebastian. But mm -hmm. is that Christ on Mary? I mean, yeah. I think so, so okay, we, yeah. Got some, so about... we got some time differences here. We got we some time <laughs> Yes. <laughs> And that's the beauty of one of these, um, you know, holy paintings that you can bring all kinds of people together across time and across geography um, for one kind of stellar cast of characters. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on here. So yes, you're absolutely right. This is the, the Virgin Mary, the Madonna, as you identified. And on her lap is the Christ child. Um, this figure here is Saint Sebastian. He's almost always shown very youthful um, and often naked and pierced through with arrows. Um, and that has to do with his, his martyrdom. So St. Sebastian um, was discovered to be a Christian in about 300 AD um, and was martyred. Uh, and they tried to martyr him by piercing him through with arrows, but miraculously the arrows missed all the vital organs. Um, he was ultimately executed in another fashion, but it's sort of this miracle that he was shot through with arrows and survived. So yes, um, I think that's one of the benefits of being a, a saint. You can maintain that level of serenity even when you've got arrows kind of coming out of your body. And then this figure here, um, some people have posited perhaps it's St. James, um, because we often, I think, see St. James with the, the scallop shell. In this instance, it's actually uh, St. Roche, or St. Rocco uh, in, in the Italian. And he lived much later than um, either of these, the other characters. Um, so he lived in the, the 1300s. Um, he was born in a small uh, region in France and uh, spent his adult life traveling to serve victims of the plague. Uh, so you see him sort of here in, dressed as a pilgrim with his staff. The scallop shell is a, a symbol of pilgrimage. Um, and so what he did is he went out and cured, cared for plague victims, ultimately contracted it himself, came down ill, um, and sort of just took himself, removed himself, and went into the woods essentially to die. Um, but here's where the dog comes in, this faithful little dog here. A dog kind of found him in the woods, brought him bread and water, apparently even licked his plague wounds and healed them, um, and in that way he recovered. So you see often Saint Roche uh, with his dog here in, in, uh, in the guise of a traveler in his traveling outfit. Um, the dog not only saved his life, but was loyal till the end. Uh, so when Saint Roche returned back to his home village, he was so... Uh, his appearance was so distorted, you know, having survived the plague, that they thought he was an imposter or a spy, and they threw him into prison, and apparently his dog was imprisoned with him. So loyal to the end. So knowing that context, does that change how you interpret any of this, or does that sort of add new insights to your, um, you know, your understanding of this work? So I have a question to ask explanation. <laughs> why why did the artist decide to mix up his, his time zones? Yeah, so why did the artist choose these particular figures to make this painting? And I should say, I've got the, um, the information in the dimensions here. Um, this was originally part of a, a larger altarpiece, so this would have been the central uh, painting in the altarpiece, but it would have been flanked by other um, images as well and placed in a chapel in Como, Italy. Um, so why did the artist choose these figures? Well, we very often see the Madonna and the um, child, you know, as a, a common, um, you know, pairing that someone would come and pray to in a chapel. But Saint Sebastian and Saint Roche were also very much associated with the plague. So in times of plague, they were the saints who were called mm -hmm. upon for intervention. Saint Sebastian, because it was thought that the the pain of arrows having pierced his body was like the pain of having the plague sores. And then St. Roche as, you know, someone who went and basically devoted his whole life to caring for victims of the plague. So these two in um, concert with one another were often called upon during times of plague. And actually when this painting was commissioned, there was an outbreak of the plague in Italy. 
So it felt like a very relevant painting to pick for today's pandemic, um, this moment of plague, of people trying to find salvation. And I think if you're able to visit this painting in person or when you're able to, um, it's in gallery four, and you can stand in front of this painting and you can just imagine almost 500 years ago, people, you know, the plague was sweeping through it Italy. Um, they, they came to this chapel, they would have prayed, they would have prayed to the Virgin, to the Christ child and to these two saints. Um, and you just imagine, I mean, it's incredible the sort of resonance with um, what's going on today. So I've got a couple of close up images and they're not great um, because it's a little pixelated, but I wanted to show you the dog. And the reason why oh. I should mention, you know, why he's got his thigh exposed here is that he would have had a big plague sore or boil um, that would have healed over. And so he's sort of gesturing to that, letting us know oh, that okay. he has survived the plague. So in that way, it's sort of a gesture of hope. Oh. Yeah. And then um, I think someone mentioned the dragonfly. It's a little bit hard to make out, but it's down there. Dragonflies at this time were considered a symbol of the devil or of evil. So here probably representing the plague itself. Um, so you have this presence of evil um, within this holy setting and these people all together. And, and one little detail that's kind of nice, you can kind of notice here are the little halos, the gold halos, another indication that these are holy figures. So I have a couple of other questions for the group, but before I ask those, does anyone have any other comments or questions? of the work so far. Okay, so I wanna to return to this idea. We're all living through a pandemic right now. And um, in the case of St. Roche, it was this dog that provided him salvation. But I'm curious to hear from you, how are you um, finding salvation during this time? How are you keeping yourself safe? And have you ever had a dog or any animal sort of rescue you or save you in a way? Anyone has any stories that they want to share that were sort of elicited by this <laughs> painting? The dog ran all the way home and mm -hmm. let you out because it was devoured by the big dog. Yeah. My beagle uh, ate up my shoes and chewed up my wallet, but I guess that doesn't. <laughs> so, sort of the opposite of providing a role of salvation <laughs> or a role of trouble. Okay. The beagle was getting into some trouble. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess you provided salvation for the beagle. <laughs> <laughs> Your mercy to the beagle was probably the salvation in that story. Well, I did cheat and look it up, but I do think it's interesting that St. Roche is also the patron saint of walking, which is the one thing we've all been able to do for exercise. Ah. Mm. Ah. Yes. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So he's walking and you can see he's got his kind of walking staff here. Yeah hopefully comfortable boots. But yeah, walking has been a salvation, I think, for a lot of people just to get out of the house and be able to move your body a little bit. Absolutely. Well, we don't have a dog, but I, you may know in England, there have been different rules for lockdown. Mm -hmm. And for a long time in England, um, one of the reasons you could leave home was to walk the dog. So there were lots of cartoons of dogs hiding their leashes in the cupboard and hiding from their owners. <laughs> That. Because everyone in the house wanted to take the dog for a walk. You were allowed one hour's walk with the dog. Yeah. Right. We, we've had some cartoons where the dogs have tried to hide everywhere. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and and go, go in places that no, where nobody can find them. So Lots yeah, of I've exhausted walked, dogs. Yeah, I've been walked ten times so far. Exactly. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> and certainly this dog here would have traversed, you know, miles and miles of countryside with St. Roche. Um, so he probably would have been very tired too. I like to um, share a little bit about, you know, how this dog tour came to be. Um, and some of you are familiar with this program, but we have a partnership with Southeastern Guide Dogs at the Ringling. Um, and so Southeastern Guide Dogs trains um, guide dogs for people who are blind or have low vision to, you know, be, you know, to allow them basically to live um, the life that they had before vision loss. And so when they are about to graduate, they work with their dogs for a period of, I think it's eight weeks. Um, and right before they're about to graduate from their training program, they come to the Ringling on a field trip with their dogs. Uh, so of course we had to design a dog themed tour that would keep the dogs interested too. 
Um, so that's how we started, you know, this idea of where, how are we going to pick out all the images of dogs? Um, and so for a lot of people on that tour, this idea of the dog as providing salvation or a lifeline is so um, poignant. And so we like to start um, when we can with this painting with that group. That's really cool. Yeah, it's a really, it's a cool program. And of course, so, unfortunately, we haven't been able to have them, you know, back for a while, but hopefully. Sorry, could I ask you one more question? Yeah. Do the dog, the dogs, I know. Our cat recognizes images on the television. Do the dogs recognize dogs in the artwork or maybe not? <laughs> I haven't noticed that they've noticed the dogs in the paintings, but we often take them to a bronze sculpture, the, um, now I'm like the Capitoline Wolf, the big wolf sculpture. Mm -hmm. um, and they are very reactive to that. They are very protective of their owners and they think it's a threat because they've got those, you know, the wolf has those bared teeth. So when it's a sculpture, they're very reactive. I don't know that they've paid too much attention to the paintings. Interesting. Yeah. So it's been, it's, it's fun to watch the different reactions. Cool. Thank Te you. Testing their stress response. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So any last questions or comments about this one before we move on to our next work? That was great. Thanks, Laura. Oh, of course. All right. So the next one, the dog's a little bit harder to find. Hmm. Ah. No, he's not. No, <laughs> some of you, are, not. Some of you have a notorious, <laughs> a notorious dog in our family. No, they're not. <laughs> the misbehaving dog, yes. So Jim, maybe your beagle can you know, take notes here. Um, so what are your first impressions of this scene? And then what do you find as you continue to look? And I know it's hard to see on a screen, but um, I've got some close-ups for a dog here. What's going on here? It's a gorgeous <clears throat> cathedral. It mm -hmm. looks like they've got a crypt that they're readying for bur some burial. Are you thinking this here? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. kind of what it looks like to me. Yeah, so you know you've identified we're in some sort of place of worship, almost like a cathedral with these really high ceilings. There's light streaming through and you're wondering, you know, perhaps if they're preparing for a burial here, this almost looks like dirt and there's someone kind of standing in the, the hole or the grave. Great. What other details are you noticing? Is that another dog over on the left? The white dog? This here? No. Uh, or this one here? Yes. No, yeah. the no, there are two. There, there's one up in the right. One way over to the left. Oh, this here? Yeah, and this guy. Is that yeah. a dog? Yes, yes. I think it is. Yeah, it's really hard to make out, and I don't have a real good close-up of that, but I think it's a dog sort of running, scampering through the space. It, it is. looks like he's creeping. Or creeping, yeah, maybe he's about to get a, um, do dogs catch mice? I don't know, maybe not. Maybe he's about to get something else. <laughs> Could be. So we've got, yeah, so we've got our, our dogs here, so good, you know, we're fitting in with our theme. We've got a dog here, a dog here, and then it's very hard to make out, but another little dog there with the white paws. So what, well, we've got the dogs, we've got the grave, what else, what else are you noticing? Well, there's a nun over to the right. This woman um, here? Yeah, mm -hmm. with oh. what looks like a little boy. Mm -hmm. And it, it looks like it's Dutch or Flemish yeah. oh, by yeah. the hats Dutch. that they're wearing. Ah, okay. So you're using the clothing of the people to place it. Yeah, and you're right. It's absolutely, this is a Dutch scene. Absolutely. They, the, the, the group with the uh, other woman and the little children, they look like they're putting their hands in handprints or making handprints. Mm hmm. And let me show you. I've got, some, I've got some details of these scenes and just really quickly. Um, here's the, the title of the work. It's the interior of the Peterskirk in Leiden in what's today the Netherlands. Um, and uh, so you're absolutely right. It's a Dutch scene. And I will show you the close ups here. Um, so yeah, there's on the side. There's the sort of the woman and the, the child. It almost looks like a little girl. It's hard to make out and the dog. And then I believe I've got there's another close-up. Um, yeah, they're almost they're almost like making handprints or they're sort of feeling or touching the surface of the ground there, right? And sort of interacting in that way. Or doing a rubbing. Doing a rubbing. That's kind of what oh. I was thinking. Yeah. So if these oh, are different grades. Yeah, it looks uh -huh. like it looks mm -hmm. like a brass rubbing. So they could be making a rubbing. Mm -hmm. Huh. Yeah. Oh yeah, brilliant. This close-up is great because you can actually see many more people. It almost looked deserted, but not from this close. 
That's great. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I, what I like, I mean, of course, it's not the same as <clears throat> doing the painting in person, but when you're in the galleries, the painting's a little bit higher on the wall and it's hard to it make up some of these details. So there is a nice advantage in being able to see some of these close-ups. So you've got this, these, this pair here, another figure grouping here, and people really, you see how expansive the space is, right? There's a lot going on. Um, and that this is not just, you know, a figment of the artist's imagination. Um, in some sense, he's taken some artistic liberties in skewing the space and making it a little bit more elongated than it actually was. Um, but during this time, um, churches were not these sort of pristine, quiet sanctuaries. They were public spaces and people would be passing through and coming through. Um, so it's a kind of a slice of life in that way. I want to give you back the, um, the, the main view here. Um, so we've, we've looked at some of these sort of little vignettes of people and there's some more people gathered back here. What do you suppose the point of including this dog so prominently? And can you see what he was doing? Did I blink yeah. on that close up long enough? We can all tell what he's doing. Sort of urinating on the, the column there. He's, yeah, he's peeing on the column. He's peeing on the column. Oh my God. <laughs> we, can't have a, we can't have a tour about dogs without a misbehaving dog. So. But why do you think, I'm curious, why do you think the artist chose to include that there, especially in kind of such a place of prominence? Well, it, to me, it seems interesting that it has all of these, um, like maybe family crests that are on the pillars. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it's a, not a nod, <laughs> but maybe it has something to do with whose family that pillar belonged to. I don't know. So maybe like, it's a sort of an intended flight on this family that the dog's going to pee all over this column. Oh, like that, that is a, that's a cool thought. It may be a political insult. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Might be a political I, I statement. It, mm -hmm. I think it could be more of this is just an everyday life coming through here. Like people are not um, coming for worship. Mm -hmm. This is just everyday life. People passing through meeting and greeting. Yeah, and in, in a lot of ways, it's just sort of a slice of life of what would have been happening as people were passing through. And so that sort of, that dog perhaps emphasizes that, that this is just what happens in life. Um, it's not, you know, necessarily idealized. Sure, what, why else might the dog be included? What does the dog stand for if the dragonfly is the devil? <laughs> what's the dog? Often we'll see dogs used to represent fidelity. Um, but I don't know in that case that this is what these dogs no. um, represent. <laughs> well, you said it was a public space. So basically, if it's seen as more of a public space, this is just basically a covered square. So a dog would normally be doing this outside. Maybe it doesn't even know that this is inside. It's just somewhere that's more comfortable. Sure, yeah, and I think that's a good point, Mary, that um, there's, I think that the animal has a lack of awareness, maybe that it has entered a, a holy space, um, and maybe even some of the behaviors of the other people, that maybe some of them are more aware that this is a, a place of worship and maybe some are not. Um, and I think, yeah, maybe it could be that the dog sort of represents this idea of naivete or unawareness of sort of the more weighty spiritual matters at play in a space like this. Um, and maybe this whole idea of the spectrum of human experience. Some people are a little bit more ignorant. Some people are more enlightened. And, you know, it's kind of up to you to make sure you, you get right um, with your religion. And that, that could be as well. But maybe it, it's a comment on religion. And or it could be a comment on religion, yeah. <laughs> not happy with religion. True. <laughs> you, all, you all are giving the, this artist kind of a hard time here. You're thinking he's pretty cynical. And that could be. It could be. Um, that it's more well, of a comment on religion itself. Well, I, I may be stretching here, but it kind of reminds me if this is a religious space, but they're doing everyday things, kind of like, you know, in Jesus's time, the money changers in the temple and, mm -hmm. you know, desecrating the religious meaning of, of the space. Yeah, it could be. It's sort of, yeah, I like that, desecrating the religious meaning of the space. Yeah, I think there's a lot of layers of, of perhaps why the dogs are included here. Um, another theory of red is just sort of for an element of humor. <laughs> I don't know if we have anyone who's Dutch on this call, if this is a particularly Dutch sense of humor or not. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's amusing in a way. Um, so maybe it has more of a significance or maybe it's just sort of, you know, a little amusing anecdote. It could, could go either way. 
So, okay, talking of amusing and allegories, um, mm -hmm. maybe the Dutch were mostly the Reformed Church. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if there was such a huge Catholic Church in the Netherlands, but if there were, maybe this is Catholic and it's a Dutch dog, so you're supposed to think that <laughs> one, this is what one thinks of the other's beliefs. Mm -hmm. I like that, Mary. So you're, yeah, you're bringing us back to our history a little bit. So this was um, painted about a little over 100 years after the Protestant Reformation. Mm. Um, and this, this uh, Peterskirk still stands today in, in Leiden. Um, and it was, it's 900 years old at this point. So it was originally built, um, it was a Catholic church, and it wasn't until 15, the 1570s that it was actually converted to a Protestant space, house of oh. worship. And that's why you see there's such sort of a, a, a barrenness. The walls have been whitewashed. They've removed all the Catholic, what they would have considered idolatry. So all of the sculptures and the paintings and the decorations. Um, so the space is, is very bare, except for these crests that I think it was Jane who brought up, that these are these family crests that indicate who is buried in the church. Um, so that's really kind of the only decoration. But you're absolutely right, Mary, that this is a space that was contentious, um, was Catholic, had been converted to a Protestant space, um, and that, that was very much a part of the landscape of, you know, 17th century Dutch painting. Ha, huh, ha. Huh. I'm writing notes. <laughs> um, In case you think I'm texting during your talk. Oh, no, and I wouldn't be offended if you were. That's totally fine. This is a casual thing. Um, but I wanted, like I mentioned, this building still stands today. And wow. this is an image that it's just beautiful. The, the Peterskirk Leiden Facebook page just posted last week. Um, of the interior shot, which I thought was so cool. Wow. So you can see the columns, that light streaming through. Um, but take a look at this and you'll notice that this artist, uh, Von Fleet, really, really took some liberties with the architecture, I think, to make it feel a little bit more monumental. He sort of stretched it. He was using a two-point perspective. Um, so when you look at the painting, the, the archways are, are elongated. Um, the people seem much smaller. So take a look at this and then we'll compare it to his painting again. And you can see it's, it's really mm -hmm. sort of been distorted a little bit. And that's something that he would do mm -hmm. in his paintings. He wasn't interested necessarily in fidelity to the architecture and representing it exactly so. He wanted more to create this, this atmosphere. And then I have to just show you this other picture because this is what I can do in a virtual program that I couldn't do in the galleries. Um, Another Facebook post, and I just, it's sort of, to me, this really amazing handshake through time where we just saw the images of those kids maybe rubbing, making a grave rubbing or doing something at, at one of the gravestones. And then still today in 2020, you have these employees of the church polishing the stones um, and, you know, rubbing the floor. And I just thought it was such a nice kind of- Very uh, cool. Yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah. Wow. Um, so, 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 so Laura- oh, Sorry, I couldn't quite hear. What was the comment? It probably was a rubbing that yeah. they were that they're doing. Yeah. And that that pretty much confirmed that. And now I'm thinking if it was converted from Catholic to Protestant, I wonder if that digging wasn't bringing up something that was someone who was buried there rather than put somebody in. I wonder about that. Yeah, if they're digging up a grave, I I don't get the sense they probably would have dug up people that had been previously interred. That would have desecrated it, it, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think it probably just would have, I don't know that that would have been a, a, a standard practice. And I, I think too, what's interesting is that a lot of these families were families that had you know deep roots in the community and they maybe even themselves had converted from Catholicism to Protestant. Protestantism, you know, at, during the Reformation. Um, so it might have been ancestors of some of the Protestant, you know, current day worshipers. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but I do know Rembrandt actually has some family that are, are buried in this very church. So they have a great website. If you go to the Peterskirk Leiden website, you can click on different they have an interactive floor plan and you can see different family graves and some contemporary pictures. So it was a lot of fun to explore how the space has been, you know, transformed. And today they're mostly using it as an event space. Um, uh, but still has, oh, and there's a, yeah, there's a close up there for you of the, the digging mm -hmm. of the grave. Um, so he was a contemporary of Vermeer then? 
Yeah, um, he was, um, yeah, I mean, they were all painting in the kind of what we call the Dutch golden age, the 17th century. I don't know exactly how they lined up generationally, um, but they would have been definitely painting in the same century. Just because the Catholic Protestantism was such a big deal in Vermeer's life, you know, because he was Catholic or married to a Catholic <laughs> or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a very, very big um, transformation for the whole, for all of the, you know, the society at the time. Absolutely. Um, so I guess I have to ask you just one more question. So we've got these dogs, you know, behaving inappropriately or not in these public spaces. Any instances you've, you've noticed around Sarasota in particular of um, having been surprised to find a dog in a, in a public place that you didn't think the dog belonged? I know I've seen a dog in a restaurant a good a couple of times, um, but I'm wondering any instances you've seen of dogs being brought in. It's a very dog friendly place. I would say is. I'd say there are many water bowls outside restaurants, and I have to say I have also wondered at. Um, I know it's kind to provide water for dogs, but is it a good idea? Because are there waterborne germs that they can give to each other? That's a good point. Yeah, now that we're all very like germ aware, I wonder if they need to be sanitizing those bowls a little bit. But I love the idea too, just that, you know, even today in Sarasota, you'll walk around and see dogs in public places. And then, you know, about 400 years ago in the Netherlands, it was kind of the same thing. You know, some things mm -hmm. are kind of universal. All right, I want to move to our next work, unless there are any other comments or questions about this one. Okay. Oh, and again, it's always kind of like, well, where's the dog? It's a little bit hard to find. I see it. <laughs> Everyone see it? I've never noticed yeah. that. And he blends totally into this woman's fur here. So, okay, this is a group portrait. What is wow. the dynamic? How would you describe the dynamic of this group? They don't look happy. <laughs> no, they don't look happy. <laughs> sort of a theme here. How they're else? rich. They're rich? Okay, how do we know they're rich? Well, we're looking at their clothing. Mm -hmm. Close. And yeah. he's giving her a paper of some kind. So there's some sort of interaction it's happening this with this paper here. What else? I'm always struck by her expression. She just seems so dour. Yes, very much so. And of course it was, you know, it was, it was, yeah, it was typical for, you know, people to present themselves very formally and not necessarily to smile in a, in a portrait. But here, I just think there's something particularly sort of serious about her that always strikes me as interesting. She's quite pretty and she'd be much prettier if she smiled. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, kind of light up her face a little bit, maybe. Yeah. Smile. Yeah, and I, I like to explore this work too, thinking about the idea of like the different senses. So let's first look at this through the lens of touch. And I say touch first because as we're looking at dogs, this is the dog tour. Her hand is so kind of warmly wrapped around this little dog. There's so much touch happening between the two. He's nestled in her arms. But how else is touch kind of at play in this, in this painting? Well, he's playing an instrument, so that's all from touch. Yeah. And, touch. and fooling with the strats, yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he's maybe tuning the violin here. Mm -hmm. So you've got his fingers very finely sort of mm -hmm. rendered. And then he's playing the bow and then the bow in turn is touching the violin. Um, what else? The I hands, would say the, sorry, go Everyone's on. hands are emphasized uh, and extra care has been taken to paint the hands in great detail and the fingers. So there, there's something uh, tactile. On that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up. I think um, the hands are given so much careful attention here. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the way that the fingers are arranged, these hands are so sort of delicate and same with the musician's hands. And then his hand here, he's holding this very thin piece of paper. But what I think is so interesting, I noticed the same thing, the hands all converge. They're really the central mm -hmm. focal point, you know, except for the one tuning. But then this other hand is almost a little afterthought. It sort of just disappears into the shadow. Mm -hmm. And I think one reason for that may have been is that this is thought to be a self-portrait of the artist. So if he's a right-handed artist and he's looking at himself as he's painting, 
that that right hand isn't necessarily going to make it into the painting in the same way with the same attention um, as a hand that's, you know, his left hand that's just sort of stable and sitting perhaps on the table. So that could be one explanation for why this hand sort of seems to be lost in the shuffle. Um, so we're thinking, we thought about touch, and I think too for me, I just want to reach out, and especially when you see it in person, the brocades, the fabrics, the silks, the velvets, the stars, it just, it's crying out for you to touch it. Um, and so for me, that's really what I was thinking about, though, the different ways that touch sort of um, sort of plays a role here. But okay, we've, we've had touch, now let's imagine sound. What kind of sounds might you hear in this painting? Or what sounds are sort of alluded to? Violin. Well, if, it's being, if it's being tuned, <laughs> not very nice. <laughs> yeah, so maybe this is a, a moment before the concert, so it's not quite beautiful sound, but sound that is um, in anticipation of beauty. The dog is quiet. The dog seems to be quiet. Yes, and we know, I mean, no offense to little dogs, but this is the kind of dog that would be a little yappy. So um, <laughs> there was it's potential a purse for dog. yapping. Mm -hmm. A purse dog. A purse dog, yes. A purse, <laughs> a purse puppy, sure. And then I wonder too about if there was going to be conversation between these two. They seem so so kind of quiet, you know? They. I would say these people don't look in tune. So maybe there's a a subtext of the violin being tuned and maybe the people need to be in tune with each other more as well. Ah, I like that. Okay, so Mary's saying these two, the, the, the woman and the man here seem a little bit out of tune. So maybe the violin's a metaphor, they're getting into tune, they're gonna kind of get on the same page here. Well, the, the, the self, the perhaps self portrait on the left mm -hmm. is really, if that's music, whatever it is, he's really getting in the way of the person trying to tune the violin. Yes, yeah. So this, this man here, so this, the, the violinist is trying to tune, and if, if you are able to look closely, which I don't think I have a close-up here, this is actually sheet music. It is the music, right. So he is holding the music, um, so you would have to imagine but he to sort of move it and renegotiate how he was holding it once the concert started. But his hand right now with the music is really in the way of the person with the bow in that right hand. Yeah, you can see his arm kind of has to go up over the top and, and wrap around. He's always in the way. So is this competition, competition between music and painting? Oh, I love that. Is this a competition between music and painting? I don't, I don't know that it, I've never read that interpretation, but I think that's a good interpretation. And then why did you say that? What made you sort of guess that that might be a interpretation of this work? Only because when he's handing the art, if the, the artist is handing him the sheet music, it's like, get out of town here. You know? Ah, so maybe there's some sort of implicit competition here where he's like, I'm the artist, I'm painting this, take this music and go. I like that. I like that. I want to think too, as we're thinking about the other senses, we've talked about touch um, and sound, but I think sight too, or the way that the gaze functions. Um, you know, this woman kind of looks out at us, the dog looks out at us, the artist looks out at us. And so there's these kind of gazes where we're implied in the scene and we're looking right back at them. But then you have the violinist looking at the artist, so your eye kind of continues to move around the composition. Um, so I think it's it's really interesting. It's a very rich piece. Um, and I've got the dimensions here for you. It's not, it's not small. I mean, it's pretty substantial when you see it in person. And you can really just kind of get lost in all of the, the rich details here. But this being a dog tour, I have to talk a little bit more about the dog. And I think I've got a close up of him. Ah, there he is. Ooh, yes. So, okay, so why, what, what role does the dog play in this painting then? If we're talking about all the different functions that a dog might have in a work of art. What, what message does he send to you in this context? There's nothing scary going on. Otherwise the dog would be in a different pose and making a noise. It's relaxed. relaxed. So perhaps okay, yeah. at least the woman holding the dog is at ease. Mm -hmm. Though she doesn't yeah, so, look very- okay, even, though her, even though her face maybe looks a little consternated. Um, the fact that the dog is relaxed, his ears are down, he's sort of cuddled in, right? If there was an intruder in the space or a sort of imminent danger, right? He'd, his hackles would be up, he'd be a little bit more alert. So it, it adds to the tone of sort of relaxation or comfort in the painting, sure. Any other thoughts about the role that well, the dog it, might play? That it's a, a wealthy woman's accoutrement. Mm. Yeah. Or yes. even fashion statement. And are they married? Do you think they, that's the artist's wife? 
That, I'm so glad you asked that. So well, first I want to talk about the first comment you made because okay. that's a really good one. That yes, this is also, I think, a status symbol, right? You're not, mm -hmm. you know, an average peasant woman off the street isn't going to have a groomed little puppy that she carries around with her. So it's a status thing. It's a fashion thing. Um, but yes, I think there's some, there is some thought that um, these two are married or betrothed, um, especially if we go with the interpretation of this being a self-portrait of the artist. Um, mm -hmm. because dogs are very often, and I think I mentioned this earlier, dogs are often used to represent fidelity in paintings. So often you'll see them to represent this idea of loyalty. Um, so the fact that you have this pair here, the dog, and then also the fact that music is represented, music being harmony or harmonious relationship between two people, does indicate that this is perhaps a portrait um, of a betrothal or a marriage. And what's interesting is there's actually two other versions, two or three other versions of this same painting by the artist. And he changes it up a little bit. In one, the dog's a different color. In one, the woman has a different headdress. But in one, there's this red ribbon that actually kind of weaves around the man and the woman and connects them visually as well. Mm. So that does lend a little bit of credence to the idea that this is a betrothal or a marriage portrait. Um, but I think certainly the dog absolutely plays that role too, the symbol of loyalty and loyalty sort of in a safe, comfortable space. Like you said, Mary, the dog is at ease in, in a situation that feels right. So does the woman look happier in the other images? <laughs> Her face is pretty much the same in all of them. Yeah, oh, I think dear. that's just the way she looks. <laughs> uh oh. We'd have to do a comparison. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. We'd have to look. Um, and what gallery is? The artist himself seems happy enough. He's sort of chipper there, you know? Is this on view at the moment, Laura? So this is not on view at the moment. No, it's in Thought I hadn't seen it. storage. Um, but when it comes back, you'll have to visit it in person because it's a really beautiful work. Okay, so my question for you before we leave this painting, you know, I like to, to make you think. Um, if you had to pick a, a, a family member, a significant other or a close friend to have a group portrait with, what dog would you choose to sort of represent the dynamics of your relationship? And I will give you an example. So if I was gonna have a portrait of me with my toddler daughter, I would have us with a, a lab because they're very drooly and slobbery and happy. And I have a lot of drool and like energy and happiness with my daughter. So it would be us in the lab and she'd be going one way, the dog would be going the other. And I'd probably look a lot like this woman here. <laughs> no, you wouldn't have that expression on your face, Laura. <laughs> well, she seems a little tired to me too. I'm gonna give her some grace. <laughs> um, what, would, what, what dog breed would you pick for your group portrait if you had to pick one? Oh, I'd pick a doodle. A doodle. We have, we, a doodle? We have a doodle and they are in your business all the time. They want to crawl inside your skin and that's just sort of our family. I have three boys and we're kind of in each other's space and on top of each other constantly. So it would have to be a, an animal without boundaries. An animal without boundaries. Mm. I like that. <laughs> Hmm. Else? I'd pick a Briard. We have friends who raise Briards as show animals, mm -hmm. show breed, and they're uh, they are herding dogs. They're big. They really um, are exuberant, mm -hmm. and that's like our family is just really exuberant. <laughs> and and they they push each other around a lot and are hard to control. Absolutely <laughs> perfect for our family. <laughs> I love that. And what was the name of the breed? A Bri Briand? Briard. B R I A R D. Bernard? What's that? Not a Saint Bernard. You said Briard. No. Sorry, Briard. I was trying to Google it. <laughs> yeah, you can Google it. Uh, B R I. -A -R oh my goodness. They're you pretty cute. It? Those are pretty cute. You, that you can hardly see their eyes. You can't see their eyes. Their hair is just right in front of their face. They're That's cute. Wild. Thank They're you for that. <laughs> every painting and where it is in the gallery. Where is this from? Ringling. Yeah. Who the artist? Okay. Anyone else want to share before and we move on to our last work? You know. Too many. Love all dogs. So you could just have them all. You could just have them all. <laughs> I'd love to have lots of dogs, lots of cats. <laughs> all right. Yeah, so much fun. <laughs> okay, well, I want to move to our final work today, which is something completely different. Oh, it is. 
And that's sort of, again, the beauty of doing these virtual programs. This is not a work that's currently on view. It's actually a print. Um, so it's very fragile and doesn't get on view a whole lot. Um, mm -hmm. But I can share it with you here digitally. So this is a woodblock print. Um, what do you make of this? What are your first impressions of this, this work of art? The dog is emaciated. Yeah, so the poor dog, I know. And I, I, let's, I hope it's just sort of stylized by the artist. Me but too. Look very, very thin, emaciated, yes. So there's the little dog there. What else is going on? Or what else, is, what else can you say sort of about the, the setting or the, the sense you get from this? Kind of a distorted sense of perspective, I think, is interesting to me. It draws me in and makes me examine all of the different aspects and either where I would fix it or why did the artist choose to do it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the perspective is a little is skewed and it kind of makes you try to navigate the space and figure it out. Sure. Any other thoughts about this one? It looks cold and yes. I don't, yes. I don't mm -hmm. know if it, I guess because the sky and the ground, mm -hmm. maybe that's just the artist's style, but it makes it look cold to me and also what she's wearing. Yes. Yeah, yes. it looks, looks like it could be snow on the ground. Mm -hmm. And she's wearing that big cape or scarf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she's got something wrapped around and she's got a kind of a long coat or a dress. And then it seems as though that there's snow on the ground, maybe even in the sky. And what's so, I had the exact same reaction. What's so interesting is this is actually um, set in Mexico. Wow. So I Googled it the other day. I said, does it ever <laughs> snow in Mexico? And they're like, yes, in some places it does. Um, and we know that the artist actually, when he was here in mm -hmm. Mexico on this, this trip that he made, it was January. So it may have been cold. But then I did a little more reading. And when he was out sketching in Mexico, when he was visiting and just trying to take in all the sites, he actually got very sick with heat stroke and had to return to the United States where he had been touring. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, if this is maybe wishful thinking that there would have been snow on the ground um, or just, you know, an aesthetic choice to use the white and gray. Um, but you're right. She does seem to be sort of wrapped up warmly and it has that kind of cold feeling that I, I picked up on as well. It does. Mm -hmm. Well, then I feel sorry for the dog because it's a very skinny stray dog. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That poor dog is a little maybe cold and hungry. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about this artist. Um, Saito Kiyoshi, Kiyoshi. Um, we have a big, uh, big uh, holding of, of his prints in our in our collection. There's actually going to be an exhibition of his work that opens this March. Um, and he is this really interesting figure. Um, he does these really modern stylized prints. Uh, he was a Japanese artist and he was um, very much known as part of the creative print movement. So if you're familiar with um, Japanese woodblock prints, you know, traditionally it would have been these um, producers of prints who would have engaged the artist to sort of design it, then they would have engaged a woodblock carver to carve the blocks and then a printer to actually execute the prints. Um, but in the creative print movement that we see in the sort of beginning of the 1900s and then beyond, um, the artists took agency over the entire process. So they were the ones designing, carving, and printing um, the block. So the, what they were producing was more akin to, you know, painting in terms of a personal expression. And this artist, uh, Saito, was uh, very much a part of that and one of the leaders in the movement. Um, so he's really known for these almost abstracted but never quite abstract works. So they're always they're always based in sort of recognizable elements. Like we all could tell that this was a woman and a dog and a, a landscape, um, but very modern in its aesthetics. Very really interesting interesting work. I wanted to ask what you think about the role of the dog here. Why do you think he included the dog? How would this composition be different without the dog? What role does the dog play in a print like this? Hmm. There are a lot of stray dogs in Mexico. So maybe it's just a, a kind of slice of life of what, you know, captures. No, it adds balance, but it I will balance. tell you, it really upsets my sense of balance that the dog is heading out of the image, but yes. not into it. Mm -hmm. So the dog it seems to be fun. going away. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think Jane was the one who said there's sort of, the, you said you would maybe fix the perspective. There's something a little bit off kilter about the way it's all arranged. And I think that's, you know, a deliberate choice on the part of the artist. There's a sense of, you know, the dog is leaving, this woman's back is to us, the building seem to be a little bit, you know, off in, a, in an interesting way. Um, it com comes together to make a really kind of complex work that's maybe deceptively simple when you first look at it. Right. 
Yeah, it makes me kind of sad because mm -hmm. <clears throat> it looks like she's going to the church. Mm -hmm. It's cold and it, the dog's going away from the church and he's skinny. Yeah. And it's like maybe he was there looking for a handout, got nothing. Mm. Yeah, so there's sort of an element of sadness for you. And I think that's, yeah, there's something maybe a little unsettling about the composition and the tone and the, the subject. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if well, she were to adopt the dog, it would give her warmth and comfort. So there's the win-win. She's got to go get that dog, bring him home, feed him, keep him warm, <laughs> and then everybody wins, right? <laughs> I do get the feeling that she's ignoring the dog, however. She mm. is. Yes. So that, that sense and, of coldness maybe literally, but also in the dynamic between <clears throat> and the dog. And we lived in Mexico in the 90s for a, a couple of years. And yes, there are a lot of stray dogs. And a lot of them are skinny. Mm. Yep, they mm -hmm. are. And you know, um, segue from that comment about Mexico, I have friends who live in Japan and that I don't believe there are stray dogs in Japan. It's just not part of the culture. Hmm. So that could also explain why the artist included this, because this was a site that was really unusual to him. That's an interesting perspective, Mary. Yeah, that maybe he wasn't used to seeing stray dogs like this. I wanted to share, um, because I, we have so many of his wonderful prints, um, another image he did of the Ooh, dog. Oh, I like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, I love that. Like, this really, to me, captures the kind of <laughs> the, the whimsy that is in a lot of his compositions, the dogs kind of looking askew. Um, and again, very stylized, but also very recognizable. Um, and I think I've got the, yeah, it's just called Dog, but um, a really fun one. Will this one be in the exhibit? You know, I don't know off the top of my head which of them are going to be on display. It's it's very likely, um, it's possible, but we do have a lot um, more than we could show in an exhibition, which is a wonderful thing. Um, Laura, yes. how, how did the museum come to own so many of his painting of his prints? Great question. So um, the Bickle family, I think it was in the the 60s maybe made the first donation of um, his prints and then more recently you can see it's credited here uh, the Citroen family gave a large gift as well um, and he was actually very popular this artist Saito was very popular with um, American collectors and so kind of in po post-war Japan there was a, a, a big exchange between Americans who were coming over to Japan um, usually through a military context and then bringing his work back to America. So he got a, a, a wide American following pretty early on in his career. Um, and, and in 56, which is the year he made the, the stray dog in Mexico, um, and, and this one was printed then as well, uh, he was invited to the United States for um, a three month tour of you know local universities and artist studios. And then his visit was extended another three months by the Asia Foundation. So there was a lot of interest very early on in his work. Um, and so a lot of collectors, you know, American collectors have have a lot of his his paintings or his prints in their in their collections. But yeah, it was a, through a really generous gift of the Citrons that we got more recently. And then I just I, I know we're running a little bit over on time, but I wanted to just share for the cat people. He also <laughs> does cats, oh, and he's no. probably actually much more famous for his cat than he is of his dogs. Uh, so you bore with us, you know, with, with all this dog talk. So here's some cats for you. Love it. I have to photograph it. Isn't that a good yeah, one? Yeah, that's a great has, there's, there's several iterations of this steady gaze series where there's multiple cats and then different colors and then facing in different directions. And you can see all of these on, on eMuseum at ringling.org. Um, if you type in uh, the screen, a lot more of these will come up and they're really fun to look at. Thank you. <laughs> and and St. Gertrude is the patron saint of cats. I just looked it up. Okay, so we oh. had, had St. Roche, and now we have St. Gertrude, the patron saint. St. Gertrude, how like cool is that? <laughs> so I just wanted to end our talk today with one more image from the <laughs> Ringling collection um, of dogs. And this is, if you're all familiar with the, um, the Glacier photographs that we have, these are actually photographic negatives. So this is glass in the collection that from which photographs would have been printed. Um, and he uh, very famously photographed the circus. Um, and so we have a huge collection of his negatives and, and printed photographs as well. So you can see actually this is in reverse, you know, the, the number here is in reverse. Um, but here's some, some mutt performing dogs at the circus. Uh, so I thought they That's looked like, fantastic. they looked like good boys. So I thought we'd end with this. And you can notice too, there's this little one who's actually wearing a dress and this one too. Oh yeah. <laughs> 
I love the big one, the big one on the left. <laughs> yeah, they're very look cute. Look at the one in the cloak. That's mm -hmm. just adorable. Yeah. So if, even if the uh, even if the print of the stray dog print made you a little sad, this will leave you with a smile on your face. <laughs> so I will leave it there unless there are any other questions or comments about dogs or art or anything else that you wanted to bring up while we're still together. Laura, this was great. Thank you Another so great much talk. for doing this. Thank you. Yes. Oh, it was Thanks, my Thanks nice. Laura. I loved it. And thank we you all for participating. <laughs> Thanks so much. All right. Thank you, Laura. Okay, everyone. Yep. We'll Next time. Soon. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.